We are in session 12 of our review of the Gospel of Matthew, starting at chapter 18. Or I should say, in a sense, ending at chapter 18, because section 12, session 12 is the way we're doing it. We're doing it in 24 sessions. 12 sessions puts us at the halfway point. You'll notice, of course, in a 18 is not half of 27 chapters, which means the last chapters are going to get some special treatment because, of course, they deal with the, the, the final week of Christ's ministry. So we've gotten a little ahead of the game in that sense, so we'll have plenty of room to really deal with some of the issues forthcoming. But we are in uh, Matthew chapter 18 tonight. Now just by way of review, to get back up to speed, most of you are aware of the fact that the, the Gospels have a design. There's four Gospels with four points of view. Matthew, being Jewish, presents Jesus the Messiah, the Mashiach Nagid. Mark focuses on his servanthood. He's really the amanuensis for Peter, we believe. Um, Luke, being a Gentile doctor, his focus is on Jesus Christ as the Son of Man and John, the Son of God. John's the one that really tells you who he is in, in the mystical sense. And uh, their genealogies in each one support their basic present. Everything in the, every detail of these four Gospels support the main theme. Uh, the, the Jewish Gospel, Matthew, starts with the first Jew, Abraham, and carries it down through the legal line, through Joseph to Jesus. Mark being uh, interested in his, his uh, servanthood, we don't really res regard ourselves concerned with the, the pedigree of a servant. Uh, Luke takes it from Adam and uh, takes it down through Mary, the bloodline. John has a genealogy most people don't recognize. The first few verses are really a genealogy of the pre-existent one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they focus on Matthew, uh, Matthew and what he said, Mark and what he did. It's really a shooting script in a sense. Luke, how he felt, his humanity. John, how he, who he was. And uh, they write to, they really focus on different audiences. The, um, uh, Matthew, the Jew, Mark and Luke, uh, the Gentiles, uh, Roman and Greek respectively. And John really is addressed to the church. And uh, the first miracle of each one reflects that perspective. The last uh, to the, cl the closing of each one uh, reflects that. Matthew, a very Jewish thing, is with the, with the resurrection. Mark has the ascension. Luke and John both set up their sequels. Luke closes with the promise of the Spirit, and of course, the, Luke volume 2, we call the book of Acts, um, follows through with the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And then John, of course, in effect, has set himself up for the revelation. And so there we are. And we could go in, there's more to this, but that's just by way of a warm up. And, of course, we're focusing on, on Matthew, but we will from time to time. I'm not going to harmonize them all, because that would take a little different approach, but we will take from time to time um, perspectives from the parallel Gospels. Okay. Section one, we went through the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, the baptism of Jesus Christ, the temptation of Jesus Christ, and the, the manifesto of the king. The Sermon on the Mount. That constituted the first seven chapters were what we considered uh, section one. And section two, we had a series of chapters, Calming the Storm, the Demoniac, the Call of Matthew, and then these two interesting uh, healings that seem to be linked by the Holy Spirit. They may have not had anything to do with one another, and yet the Holy Spirit links them up in a very strange way for, for its own purposes. And uh, then we have uh, the 12 sent out in response to John the Baptist, and then Sabbath issues, the unpardonable sin. That constituted uh, the second section. Chapter 12 closes section 2 and also is, in effect, a watershed chapter in the Gospel of Matthew because from chapter 12 on, Jesus changes his style. Chapter 12, they reject him. They attribute his, his uh, uh, miracles to uh, uh, Satan. And so from that point on, uh, he, we notice, and he in fact expresses that in chapter 13, that from that point on, he speaks in public only in parables. He only explains things in private. A very strange difference you need to understand. So when you, it's a, it's, it's a, it ends the presentation of the kingdom to Israel. And uh, so the rejection didn't just occur at the cross, it occurred, it occurred actually in chapter 12. And uh, so that's from that point on, Jesus will speak only in parables. Now, chap and so when we get to chapter 13, that's explained as we go through the seven kingdom parables. Then there's a series of chapters, the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000, and then the, uh, the time at Caesarea Philippi. 
where Peter has his finest moment. Who do they say? Who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. There's a, as we went through those, we got into the Herods, and I won't take you through all those by review, but I'll just mention the, a, a few that you really do need to know. Herod the Great, of course, the one that slew the children of Bethlehem. Herod Antipas was his son, and uh, of Herod the Great. He really wasn't a king, he was a tetrarch, just, just the Galilee area, actually. Uh, he's the one that had John the Baptist killed, and he, before whom Jesus was silent uh, in Luke 23 and elsewhere. His son is Herod Agrippa, and he's the one that slew James and imprisoned Peter. Uh, he was the grandson of Herod the Great, so we've got the great, his son Antipas, and his son Agrippa, and then Agrippa the second, uh, before whom Paul is tried. So you'll run into these names. When in Acts, when it's it's Herod Agrippa, it's the son of the Agrippa of the of the New Testament or the, the earlier period, I should say. Okay, are we together? Okay. So we have a, a Herod the Great, his son, his grandson, his, and his great grandson. Um, there are many others, but those are the ones that you will really run into. Feeding the multitudes. We had 5,000 and 4,000, didn't we? Matthew 14 and Matthew 15. And uh, one was predominantly Jews, the other is predominantly Gentiles. One took place in Galilee, at Bethsaida, and the other one took place at Decapolis, a Gentile turf. Um, one had five loaves and two fish left over, the other one had seven loaves and a few fish. Holy Spirit didn't tell you how many fish because it's focusing for some reason on the seven, interestingly enough. And uh, in the 5,000, we had 12 baskets left over. And uh, the other, we had seven baskets left over. So we see some structuring going on here. And uh, if you're a normal, well-adjusted person reading your Bible, you ignore those things. Uh, we just go on and enjoy the story. If you've been to one of my Bible studies, of course, you know you're no longer a normal, well-adjusted reader. Because you'll remember that I, I, I just always at least try to arouse a suspicion that these things might be very, there may be meaning hidden behind all these. Uh, the one was in the spring of the year, and the other was in the summer. One, the crowd was with him one day, and the other, the crowd was with him three days. Really? Is there something else going on here? Bear in mind, Matthew was Jewish, so we want to use a Jewish hermeneutic as we look at Matthew. And uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We went from, in Matthew 15 also, we talked about the traditions of Judaism in contrast to the commandments of God. And we went through the fact that as you lengthen the tether to the text, you tend to get in trouble. Mosaic Judaism was based on the Torah. And when we speak of, and most of us uh, would think of Judaism, we think of the, the writings of Moses, except they added what they call oral law, oral traditions that led to Pharisaical Judaism from about 400 BC and following. And that's what's prevalent during Christ's ministry against whom he preaches. Again and again and again, we find him in, in uh, conflict, if you will, with the Pharisees who are adding things to what God said. And uh, that obviously uh, uh, creates, increases the tension. That, those oral laws get codified in writing from the 3rd through the 6th century A.D. in what's called the Talmud. There's a Jewish Talmud, which actually was done in Tiberias, and a Babylonian Talmud. And interestingly enough, the, Balmo, the, the uh, Babylonian Talmud is the more authoritative of the two because the academy that produced it lasted uh, essentially longer, I guess. But uh, in the 12th century, we encounter uh, the strange collection of writings, Jewish mysticism known as the Kabbalah. And uh, it is even further uh, uh, away from the, 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 the rule of the, the, the text itself, the, Mo, the, the laws of Moses. The 18th century, uh, out of that emerges Hasidic Judaism that you associate with what some people would call Orthodox. Orthodox can mean many things, but there's a specific uh, style of that in New York and in Israel called the, the Hasidim, and uh, with the black hats and the ringlets on the, on, the, on the sideburns and so forth. A remez in Hebrew is a hint of something deeper. As we go through all those... those uh, Passages, we know, why are the stories in the particular order? They're not ex necessarily in exactly chronological order. Chapter 12, we have Jesus rejected by Israel. Chapter 13, we have the seven kingdoms parables, which clearly are the church, because they disclose things that were hidden, in the, hidden from the Old Testament. And uh, chapter 14, we have maybe another layer of insight beyond the direct narrative as we watch the, the feedings and so forth. 
And uh, let's stand back from the whole picture. We have Herod introduced as the usurper, king of this age, who is living in open adultery. That's what caused John the Baptist to get in prison and ultimately killed. He slaughters the prophet at the request of a woman. And John, of course, was the closing of the Old Testament. Jesus highlights that in both Matthew 11 and, and, uh, and uh, Luke 16. Next, we find people are fed in the wilderness. In one case, with 12 baskets left over, which I suggest to you might represent a Jewish symbol. 12 tribes, 12 disciples who are to judge the 12 tribes. And uh, in Revelation 7, we again have the 12 tribes emphasized. And the Lord deliberately sets them up in a boat in the middle of the sea while he prays on a mountain. The boat typologically uh, is after one great boat, Noah's Ark, which uh, is kephar, is, is, is uh, pitched within and without. That word pitch is translated in every other chapter in the Bible, uh, atonement. And the sea, of course, is a type of the Gentile nations. So we have them preserved through a boat on the sea, interestingly enough. The Lord's praying, while this is going on, the Lord's praying for them while he's on the mountain. The mountain's a type of government from Daniel 2 and elsewhere. He's interceding for the boat on a stormy sea. And then Peter's the called out one. Is that the ecclesia? Is there something modeling here? And uh, we should remember as the call out assembly, when, uh, we do fine when we have our eyes on him. We take our eyes off him, we sink. And Peter taught us that lesson. Well, so maybe there's a lot more going on here structurally than we're at first aware of. Then we climax with what? The transfiguration, Matthew 17. Uh, chapter 16 closed with the, ver the verse saying, there are some of you that will see the kingdom of God, and the next chapter gives them an opportunity. And of course, the transfiguration is a big deal, of course. We have, well, there are two ministries in the Old Testament that were unfinished, Moses and Elijah. Interesting left, they were unfinished. And uh, on Matthew 17, we appear to have a staff meeting going on because uh, Peter, in his first and second letter, gives us allusions to what was discussed with the Lord and Moses and Elijah while on that mountain. And it somehow is connected with the second coming. There's that, that's the overtone. And so, and, and these, why these two? Why Moses and Elijah? Well, Elijah uh, had unique powers granted him, fire from heaven, and he shut the heaven for three and a half years. And uh, Moses turned water into blood and plagues. These are the same four powers that identify the two witnesses in Revelation 11. That's one reason we take the view. There are other defendable views, but other people have different ideas. We suspect that a lot, Moses and Elijah, or their direct representatives in some way, are the two witnesses. And uh, so all the, all the elements of the future kingdom were uh, present in Matthew 17. We have Jesus in glory, not in his humiliation. Moses is in glory, radiant and shining. He represents the redeemed through death. Elijah's there in glory. He represents those that have entered the kingdom uh, through rapture or translation. And uh, interestingly enough, that's a, that's a viewpoint, suggestion. If that's the case, who is Peter, James, and John? And they are Israel, or the remnant in the flesh. The 12 apostles will rule over the 12 tribes. As they come down the mountain, there's a multitude at the foot of the mountain that might be viewing, be viewed as those that were brought into the kingdom after it has been established as described. Those are all just possibilities, I'll leave it to you. That chapter closes with the issue of paying tribute, a tax. And, Jesus, and they ask Peter, does the Lord pay tax? He says, sure, yeah, absolutely. He spoke a little too quickly because it was a tax they, did not, they were not liable for necessarily. But Jesus says, that's okay, go, go to get a fish and so forth. Turns out the fish, the, the coin that we're dealing with there is a, a, a two drachma coin. A drachma is a day's wages, so it's a really four days wages worth of coin. That's a non-trivial tax, if you will. And many people think, well, it's a temple tax. They have all these other conjectures. If they really do the homework, it's clear that you know, that was a Herodian or Roman tax. Matthew ought to know he was a tax collector in the past, okay, which he'd given up that franchise, okay. Okay, so that closes, well, I should say this chapter with those will close section one. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 18. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Boy, oh boy, oh boy, they, they, they just got off the mountain with this transfiguration experience, at least Peter, James, and John did, and now they're kind of... Uh, you see the flesh show up, their ambition shows up. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus then, it's interesting, he, he, little, he, Jesus called a little child on him and set him in the midst of them. 
It said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And as we understand or try to understand what Jesus is teaching them, let's not lose sight of the context. Clearly, Jesus loves the children. I'm not here to take away from any of that. But he's doing something else too. He's doing all of that in, in, as a teaching lesson to them, to, as a counter to this ambition. Who's going to be the greatest? Hey, you've got to be like a little child. And, and, and as he talks about little children, realize that you can apply what he's saying about them to the disciples and to you and me. Not because of our age, but because of our need to be uh, humble and as a little child. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same shall be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, this is Christ's rebuttal to their ambition. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Wow. Boy, does that create opportunities. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he was drowned in the depth of the sea. Boy. We could amplify that, but I don't think we need to. Then we get to this interesting verse, a verse you want to remember. He says, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. We can talk about that. The first one that pops into your mind is Judas, right? He betrayed Christ. In Psalm 41, verse 9, it was predicted in the Psalms. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Widely recognized by scholars as a, as a prophecy of Judas himself. What did Jesus say? Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. So Judas was predicted that he would betray Christ, right? Did Judas have free will or not? Well, see, a lot of people struggle with that. When we were in, in YWAM with the students there, that was one of the common questions that came up with the, was this whole issue of the apparent paradox between predestination and free will. If it's prophesied, you'd, it feels like it's predestined. They sound like the same thing, and may, in a way they are. And yet, um, that would seem to deny free will. One of the things you need to recognize as we wrestle with that issue is it is only a paradox when you're viewing it from within the time dimension. You and I are in the time dimension. So to us, it appears like a paradox. But if you've taken a graduate course in paradox resolution, which is a, a, a typical subject in advanced math and such, one of the things you need to do is you get out of the box. Step, step outside the restraints that you feel or that you may, that are imposed or you may feel are imposed on your problem. God is outside time. Time, we, thanks to 20th century science, we now know that time is a physical property. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. So God is not somebody who's got lots of time. He's outside time altogether. Big difference. And he alone, not the angels, he alone knows the end from the beginning. So you're free to do whatever you like. And yet, God knows what choice you're going to make. When you get to a crossroads and you don't know which one you're going to take and you decide to pick one, he happens to know which one you're going to pick in advance because he's outside time. So for us, we still have free will. But God knows what you're going to do and that's one of the demonstrations of who he is by giving us prophecy, by writing history before it happens. That's the way he authenticates the Bible. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. You understand it's an integrated message and that it writes history before it happens. You can prove that. So, yes, Judas could have repented. He didn't have to do that. But he did. And we're going to examine the details of that when we get to later chapters in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the book of Matthew. But when Jesus says, woe unto the world because of offenses, that includes offenses plural, all kinds. 
We're going to talk a little bit about false teachers. Will there be false teachers? Absolutely. Does that mean the false teacher that's teaching falsely has no free will? No, he has free will. God just is predicting in advance through his apostles that's going to come. And that's happening before our very eyes. One of the guys that I would never want to trade places with is a guy that wrote a novel, a guy by the name of Dan Brown, called The Da Vinci Codes. A, a very cleverly crafted story, very deceptively presented, preceded by a fact sheet, which claims that everything in this thing is true and it's not, it's fraud, and it's deliberate, knowing fraud with an agenda, a knowing agenda of attacking the person of Jesus Christ. And I wouldn't want to be in his shoes when he discovers, when he stands before the judgment seat and discovers the guy in charge is the guy that he's been libeling for money. Man. But that's not all that's going on. Satan's having a field day. He, he, Dan Brown may not realize it. He's an agency of Satan. And so are other people. There's this National Geographic hasn't even gone to press yet at the time I'm speaking here. And already it's being talked about coast to coast. They've got a, a feature article on the so-called Gospel of Judas. The Gospel of Judas. What's bizarre, there's no reason. This is not a recent discovery. The, the copy they're talking about was, was, has, 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 was uh, discovered in Egypt in 1978. Okay, so this isn't like it's a hot thing. They, they've chosen to do this because the so-called Gnostic Gospels are the foundation for Dan Brown's novel. And when Ron Howard gets, releases his movie, uh, which is going to be a blockbuster movie, and it's going to be a, create a tsunami across the world uh, for discussion, just as the passion of, in, in, you know, initiated an enormous amount of discussion on the reality of Jesus Christ and its many implications. Now, this is doing the same thing uh, for Satan. That movie is going to be talked about. Everybody's going to see that movie. The people who are unbelievable will, 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 will see it, obviously. The people who are marginal Christians will see it and get confused. And the people, those that are really serious about Jesus Christ, may also go to see it for, their, for awareness reasons, but will easily shred the fraud, despite the, fa the, the beautiful theatrics, etc. Uh, the Gospel of Judas, so is surfacing just this time. Now, what on earth is the Gospel of Judas? A text that was discovered in Egypt... It was written in Coptic. That was the language of ancient Egypt for Christians. Right up to about the 9th century. It's a codex, meaning it's a book with pages, not a scroll, which, which is, it, it, it dates it, you know, everything from the 1st, 2nd century on where codexes rather than scrolls typically. Scrolls were earlier. Um, so it's a, it's a codex, as it's called. Pages are badly damaged. There are lots of lacuna. Those are blank spaces, things that have been damaged for some reason that are uh, difficult to fill, but it's not hard to follow the, the, the train of it. And this is not a new discovery. It's been lost for about 1,700 years. It was written in the 3rd or 4th century, still several centuries after the fact, understand. But uh, uh, about 180 A.D., 2nd century A.D., Irenaeus knew of the book then, so apparently it was around back then, um, and he condemned it as heretical. Some people, there's some, some authorities say gee, that most of the, the so-called Gnostic Gospels are written in the 3rd and 4th century. This is one of the earlier ones, but it's still a Gnostic Gospel. What on earth is a Gnostic Gospel? Gnostic Gospels are not Gospels at all, first of all. A Gospel has verifiable, it's a, it's a history with verifiable data in it that you can check. These aren't Gospels at all. They're speculative opinions, totally devoid of any verifiable facts. That makes them, as, even as a, as a group, they were all written under false pseudonyms, false names, as a, in an attempt to gain legitimacy. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the, you know, there's, there are all these in the early centuries, typically some in the second, but many in the third and fourth. People would write, dream these things up. See, they didn't have internet to blog with. They had to do something like this. So they, they, and some of them may have had agendas. Some of them may, may even been well-intentioned. Who knows? But they were falsehoods. And the church recognized them at the time. 
They never gained any legitimacy. But the very fact that they're written under false names, pretentious names, uh, made them ineligible to be part of the canon uh, because that was the whole idea. The early church rejected documents under pseudonyms as being inconsistent with the concept of God-breathed inspiration. These guys were not dummies. And uh, they're all written, furthermore, they're written several centuries after the gospel period. That's in contrast to the letters of Paul and others that were contemporaneous with the events. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, there were people in his audience that were in Galilee and saw the resurrected Christ when he appeared to 500 of them. And that's so alluded there and so forth. See, if I was going to, if I was going to uh, sell you the idea that in November of 1993 in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas, that J JF, John F. Kennedy was killed with a bow and arrow, how many of you would buy that? The reason you'd laugh me out of the room is because there's too many people around that saw it happen. That's nonsense. There may be other subtleties that we could talk about that aren't that well known, but that's not the, but the, 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 the those facts are facts. And for me to try to fly a story in this generation would be ridiculous. A couple of generations from now, if you found a document that tried to describe how it all happened with a bow and arrow, there might be some guys that would probably, gee, maybe so, you know. We could go on to some other examples, but let's move on. See, a large number of these documents emerged in the centuries following the ministries and were universally rejected by the church. And uh, copies of these were found, a large bunch of these were found in 1945 at Hag Hamani, which is a place in, uh, is in, uh, uh, in Egypt. And uh, uh, most of these were dating from the 3rd and 4th centuries. The Gospel of Judas is a little earlier, but it's still a Gnostic Gospel. And... Uh, Examples are the Gospel of Thomas, that's the one that is used as a foundation stone for the Da Vinci Code uh, uh, fraud. Uh, but even so, even if you accept what Thomas said was true, it still doesn't support the way they use it. They're trying to prove that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. The Gospel of Thomas doesn't open that door at all. And the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Ruth, and about four dozen others. These are Gnostic Gospels. They're, they're, they're frauds, obviously. And uh, scholars widely agree that none of these tests contain any historically reliable information. And uh, they're written in the second century or later. And uh, it was a her Gnosticism was a heresy rampant in the Roman Empire from the second century on, maybe even a little earlier. Its name came from the Greek word kenosis which means to know. And the whole idea was that they were in the know. They believed that knowledge was the way to salvation. And it was that way, it's one of the reasons it was condemned as false and heretical by several writers of the New Testament. We have New Testament writers that come to our aid here. And there are several different groups that say, gee, what do the Gnostics believe? Well, it isn't as if they had a consistent belief. Within that group, there's several very widely varying views, all the way from high-minded ascetics on the one hand to licentious charlatans on the other. And... Uh, it, the, the claims they made is that we're all divine. We have the spark of divine in us, but we're trapped in a physical world that's evil. And Jesus came to give us knowledge of how to escape this world and get back to the, what they call the kingdom of light, where we really belong. In Gnosticism, salvation is by knowledge of mysteries rather than the in faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And uh, Gnostic literature speaks of deities, of powers of the universe, um, such as the uh, Yaldabaoth, the Seth, the Barbello, uh, which is an emanation of the Supreme Being. Much of this, by the way, echoes of the Kabbalah, which is a Jewish, in a sense, a Jewish form of the same thing. Sophia and others. And uh, the Gnostic books have myths of creation involving emanations of the Supreme Being, multiple heavens, each with their rulers, and so forth and so on. And uh, most of them see matter, physical matter, as evil, and believe that Jesus only appeared to have flesh, that his physical body was a mere phantom. The Gnostics would tell you that when Jesus walked in the sand, it didn't leave footprints. And that was, that's their mentality. There's only one occasion I know that Jesus walked and didn't leave footprints. That was on, when he walked on water, yeah. <laughs> Christ, the Gnostic, is just a principle rather than a person. It's interesting to me, the parallel between Gnosticism and Kabbalah is surprising because in both cases, there are attempts to depersonalize God to depersonalize God. 
God's gone to such extremes to present himself as a person, even becoming flesh and dwelling among us, and uh, we need to embrace that, understand that. So where do we find out about all this stuff? Well, there are sources, the best source, some of the best sources are right in the New Testament, but one of the, the refutation by the church fathers. If you go through the church father text, Irenaeus is, is against heresies. He wrote a whole diatribe on all of this. Hippolytus, the refutation of all heresies. Epiphanius, the uh, Panarian and Tertullian wrote against Marcion. There's a whole series of the Antonicene fathers that uh, shred this stuff. But perhaps uh, the most useful ones are the ones right in your lap, uh, condemned by the writers of the New Testament. Paul emphasized a wisdom and knowledge that comes from God and not through idle speculation, fables, and moral laxity. Colossians 2, 1 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 2, Titus 1 are just a few selections that you'll find in Paul's writings. John, both in his gospel and in his epistles, centered the, his teaching uh, uh, on the, uh, the, the her, her, heretical uh, teaching uh, that you would, you would be called Gnostic and so forth. A couple samples, just a couple of quick samples. 2 Timothy 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And the Colossians 2.8, which is a great summary verse, will be worth part of your memory collection. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Boy, we need to, we need to hang on to that one. Let's get back to Matthew 18 and keep moving here. Verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. If thine, eye, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And I think if we took that literally, many of us would be very severely incapacitated. This is what some, what, what a, a rhetorical device called a hyperbole. He's saying that to get em, as a, his way of emphasizing how serious it is. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. See, again, he's, he's the child is right still in the middle of them. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. This is Matthew chapter 18, 10, verse 10, is a validation of guardian angels. I have to tell you candidly, I was a very relatively uh, mature Christian, but always somehow pre as a teenager or whatever, I... I, I uh, uh, I always presume guardian angels is one of those little idioms that we just, you know, use, you know, in the same category as, you know, I don't know, as, as, as a colorful, harmless legend or something. I was frankly startled one day when I happened to be reading Matthew 18, verse 10, realized, whoops, the concept of a guardian angel isn't just a colorful little tradition, it's scriptural. I think that's pretty cool, you know, that's pretty neat. Um, I do know that mine gets overtime. You know, I know that mine gets overtime. Now, the question that there in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? This verse causes many to presume that guardian angels are just for the ones that are saved. Boy, it's an argument from silence, but it makes me nervous. You know, is that, the way you get around that one is make sure you're saved. <laughs> the nature of angels. You know, it's interesting. Angels, when you see them appear, they don't always appear, but when they appear, they're always in human form. They were in Sodom and Gomorrah. At the resurrection and the ascension, they were twos, always in twos, apparently. They spoke, took men by the hand. They ate meals. They're tangible when they want to be. They don't have to be, but they, when they want to be. They're capable of a direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt is perhaps the archetype example of that. One angel slaughtered 185,000 Syrians one night after dinner. I always wondered how many Syrians were there there. 
Were there several hundred and they just slit every man, other man's throat or something? I mean, you know, that would, that's always an impressive way to leave a... Leave a anyway, um, I mention all of this to indicate, I strongly suspect, that fallen angels and demons are different things altogether. Because demons that we encounter in the New Testament always are seeking embodiment, even in animals as a last resort. We talked about that before. This is just by way of review. Let's get back to Matthew 18. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. <coughs> Boy, that's an important verse. That's what he's all about. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them is gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Obviously, the one that re getting the one that lost is a source of major joy when it's returned. That's his point. And I don't think there's, I don't think we need to beat that. I think it's pretty clear. Okay. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Wow. That raises another question we frequently get from concerned parents. Where do we get this idea that children below the age of accountability, whatever that is, um, are saved? Well, we get that from several places. Um, you can build a pretty strong case that children before the age of accountability, and that raises another debate, and I don't have an answer to that one. Uh, there's some traditional answers, and then there's probably, you know, it's, it's God's judgment, I'm sure. Um, in 2 Samuel 12, the incident of David is worth understanding, and Paul's strange remark in Romans 7 is one to take a look at. In 2 Samuel 12, David was bemoaning his child that was ill, and uh, when, the child, when he gets word the child has died, he cleans up, stops fasting, gets dressed, gets ready to go back to work. And the servants are startled. Then said a servant, said, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. See, to them it looked backwards. Understand it. I can understand their view. And he said, David said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Notice the next sentence. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So David's expectation is that he, when he's with God, will be with his, side, with his child. There's another example. I've, I didn't make a slide for it in my haste. Haste makes race, waste, I'm told. And that's to take a look at the first and last chapter of the book of Job. In chapter 1, he has a list of animals. A thousand of these, 500 of those. It's a whole list of animals. And he has seven sons and three daughters. And you know the story of Job, how Satan incrementally wipes them out. Among that, he, of course, loses all his animals. And he loses his seven sons and three daughters. And a lot of other things. And we go through the dialogues and that whole thing. And until finally, at the end, God steps in and even answers for Job and so on. But in the last chapter... God rewards Job for his diligence and his faithfulness by doubling everything he lost. And you look at the list of animals, and where there was a thousand, there's now two thousand, where there's five hundred, there's, you know, every, everyone that's listed that were listed in chapter one are there with twice the number. And he also gets seven daughters and three, I mean, uh, seven sons and three daughters. And as you're reading that, if you're attentive, you're sort of disappointed. I mean, you know, you, you got double everything else. Why didn't you get 14 sons and six daughters? You know Why? The others are waiting for him. He hasn't lost them. They're up there waiting for him. And when you realize that, that can be very moving discovery to a parent that's lost a child. But Paul makes a strange remark in Romans chapter 7, which we commonly call law school. Paul's definitive statement of Christian doctrine we call the book of Romans really defines what sin is all about, what the law is all about. It is your basic course in foundational theology. 
But as in Romans 7, where Paul is dealing with the law and sin and all that, he makes a strange remark at verse 9. I've given the first the, the, the verses on either side of that so you pick up the flavor of it. Paul says, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, that is the law, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin is dead. For without the law, sin was dead. Then he gets to verse 9. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to, to life, I found to be unto death. What on earth is Paul talking about here? I was alive outside the law, without the law, not without having it, but being outside the law, so to speak. I, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. How interesting. Most scholars, not all, uh, yeah, I'd say the majority of scholars believe that what Paul is referring to here is his childhood before the age of accountability. He's alive without the law. He's not accountable to the law, so he's alive. When the law came, when the law is in effect, he's in trouble. Are we together? That's one of the bases uh, why people believe that children before the age of accountability are saved. And um, uh, I think that's the prevailing opinion. Not, not, <laughs> anything in theology has controversy, but um, uh, I think it's a very widely held opinion. And uh, that's why, if that's true, when the rapture occurs, the, it's going to be the biggest shock the planet Earth has ever had. Bigger than the flood of Noah, in a sense. Every bit is pervasive. Well, let's deal with torts. Torts are injuries that one person does to another. And I want to talk a little bit about due process. Uh, one of the most puzzling and painful experiences I've had is getting into professional Christianity. I came to the Lord as a teenager, had a love for the Word of God through more than 60 years of study. Uh, as a layman, I taught the Bible for 25 years at uh, Monday nights at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and, and subsequently, uh, before then and subsequently at other places. I've loved the Bible, but I was a layman. I was busy with my executive career, and I have to be very candid about my executive career. The Lord allowed me to be at the right place at the right time, and I was involved with and backed by some of the most outstanding personalities on the planet Earth. I look back on those days with great gratitude. These were guys that weren't saved, but they were guys of ethics and experience that I learned from precious lessons. I look back at that now and realize I was spoiled because I took a lot for granted in the business world that I came from. I've served on 12 public boards, many more, but I've been in 100 different deals in venture capital since, but I've been served as a board of, on the board of directors of 12 public companies over a 30-year period. Only once that I can recall did we have to remove an officer for breach of fiduciary duty. I've been in professional Christianity for 15 years. I've served on many boards in the, in the Christian field too, various ministries I, I won't mention, to be able to speak freely. We've had to do it three times in 10 years. 12 companies, 30 years, once. A relatively few in 10 years, at least three times. Some of that's just poor training. But there's, it, something goes deeper. I want to talk about dealing with injuries, personal injuries in that sense, not physical injuries, other kinds. And I want to talk a little about due process. Matthew 18, verse 15 and following, a couple of verses, is the core description of how we in the body are supposed to be dealing with these things. Jesus says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That's step one. If that works, praise God. If it doesn't, you go to the next verse, verse 16. 
But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. That's not rocket science. That's basic common law. In fact, that's where it gets the that's where the common law gets it, of course, is for the Bible. That makes sense? I think so. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it under the church, that is the assembly. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. In other words, you throw him out into the world. Put him out of the fellowship. I hesitated to insert here my little diatribe about gossip, the most painful sin. You've been in any of our other studies, but Book of Proverbs elsewhere, we usually use this as a springboard to go through a series of verses in the Scripture which deals with one of the most hurtful sins we can conduct. There are probably bigger sins in terms of the gravity of them, but there certainly are no more, there, there's probably more pain caused by gossip than anything, any of the other misconducts we indulge in. It quietly does its unseen damage behind the scenes. And uh, slander is like toothpaste out of a tube. You can't put it back in. It's out. And uh, it's astonishing to realize how many scriptures deal with gossip. What's even more astonishing to me, the fact that the untrained and the non-diligent do that is bad enough. What shocks me is to discover how many ministries are managed by hearsay? There are some very prominent ministries that have littered the landscape with careers that have been crashed without any due process, without being con able to confront their accusers, without having the facts certified by a couple of witnesses on hearsay. One of the benefits of some of the denominations is that they have installed what we would call due process. That if a pastor is accused of something, there is a procedure that verifies the facts before action is taken and also gives him a chance to be confronted and even if he's guilty, re-established re by a process with the, with, the, with the Board of Elders. There is what they call in law due process. There's a process. But it's disturbing to discover how many ministries. You have people whose careers and commitments are trash canned by what really is gossip and, and an a, 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 a ambitious contingent on a board, whatever, there's different factors involved that do it. Due process, not management by hearsay. I have been asked by a number of pastors to do a briefing package on this subject. And I have declined to do that because I don't want to be a pawn in the politics of what's going on. I'm aware of several situations that are tragic, that, I, that there are aspects of which I think are a stench in the nostrils of God. But at the same time, the situation is such that I can easily be a pawn to, uh, 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 in, the, in the political process there. There was an incident in um, Orange County where the dean of a law school was accused by a student of plagiarism. And it hit the press in which he was set aside from his job while the investigation goes on. And anybody reading the paper that is legally sensitive must be shocked because he's lost his job and they haven't even finished their investigation. That's called grounds for a lawsuit. And uh, I had the whole file brought to me. And I recommended to the injured party that he do file a lawsuit. But it's a church. It's a corporation. And uh, I, 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 I mean, I've been right. Don't misunderstand me. But I, that's what I invited, advised him to do. And I actually was quite delighted uh, in the whole situation, in a sense, because here was a case study where a law school took the position publicly that Matthew 18 doesn't apply to us. That's for the laity. Can you imagine? 
And uh, it ended up getting settled, and uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, it doesn't serve purpose to go through all the fact situation. But I was delighted because it wasn't in the usual denominational church setting. It was a open, publicly aired. I could all my facts were in the file. It wasn't like I was talking out of school by by some denomination or some church situation. But anyway, the the attitude tends to be you're guilty until proven innocent. Some pastors accused of some impropriety. The immediate presumption by many, not everybody, fortunately. Is that he's, he, he is, has burden. He's not burdened to prove himself. I mean, it's not, he's not, they're not burdened to prove that he's guilty. He's on the defensive. You see, c- congregations want their pastors sinless. I think there's something about that in the scripture too. And does he get a chance to confront his accusers? More often than not, he doesn't. And we could go on and on. Um, let's just let's let's go on and on. <laughs> Verse 18, verily, Jesus says, verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Very important verse because the authority that he purports to have been given Peter in Luke chapter 16 of Caesarea Philippi isn't unique to Peter. A lot of people make a big case out of that. Wait a minute, whatever that was is given here to all of them. Let's remember that. As you try, try to interpret Chapter 16, let's realize that Peter isn't unique in that sense. He, he, he gives us whatever, he's, he's speaking to all of them here. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever, whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth, that's touching, anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Boy, it's a precious verse. We quote it so often, so glibly in some context. Let's really realize what that says. Do you believe it? Let's have an amen then. Okay, all right. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Remember this passage? We know this, right? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times 7. What do you make of that? What's Jesus saying? That there's no limit? That's what most people assume he's talking about. Right? Except it turns out there may be more behind. The say. I'm not saying that isn't a valid way to apply the verse. I don't think you necessarily get a score pad and keep track. Okay, I don't think that's what he's saying. He's saying you know, 7 times, make, well, gee, I've... I've, I've uh, forgiven you six times. This is it, brother, you know. That's not what he's saying. I don't think he's saying you count to 489 and then the next one's it. But that's the way it was with God. It may surprise you here. 70 times 7. The Sabbath for the land was six years to cultivate, seventh to rest. That's in Leviticus 25, verses 1 to 7, right? For 490 years... Israel failed to observe the Sabbath of the land. They did the Sabbath of, uh, of, of uh, Shabbat, but not the land. For 490 years, they failed to keep the Sabbath year of the land. And in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21, it explains why it was that the southern kingdom went into captivity for 70 years. The northern kingdom got wiped out totally. The southern kingdom would have been wiped out except for God's commitment to David. It wasn't that they deserved to have captivity and then come back. It was God's commitment to David. So they went into captivity for 70 years and then returned to the land. To the day, by the way. But since they failed to keep the Sabbath of the land, the Lord said, you owe me 70. And he sent them to captivity in Babylon. He forgave them 70 times 7 and then called what was due. And that's not a contrived uh, uh, perspective. It's in second, it's express in Second Chronicles 36, verse 20 and 21. Now, it's, furthermore, I think we're indebted to Clarence Larkin to have first published this in 1919. It's rather interesting. From Abraham to the Exodus, at least by one reckoning here, uh, was 505 years. And uh, because of Genesis uh, 12 and Galatians 3, we have 75 plus 430. That adds up to 505 years. But during that period, 
there was a 15-year period that Ishmael was the heir apparent before Isaac was ordained, so to speak, born and ordained. Well, if you, tack, if you subtract 15 of that the usurper was around, so to speak, you've got 490 years. That's curious, especially when you look at from Exodus to the temple. It began in 1 Kings 6 uh, to 8 is where it's begun, and it was completed, 1 Kings 6, 38. So, uh, uh, so you got 494 plus 7, so that's 601 years. But during that period is a period called the Judges, where there were six servitudes, Mesopotamia, the Moabites, Canaanites, Midianites, Ammonites, and Philistines. And if you take those passages and add up the periods of servitude, it adds up to 111 years. When you subtract the 111 years there in servitude from the others, again, you get 490 years. I think that's kind of interesting. From the temple to the Edict of Artaxerxes, 1 Kings 8, that's 1005 B.C., and Nehemiah 2, it's 445 B.C., as we've reviewed many times. We will again when we get to uh, chapter 21, Matthew. Um, that's 560 years, but that, from that we subtract the Babylonian captivity. In each of these cases, the calendar period, you take it and subtract the period that Israel's in disfavor, and you get always 490 years. When you get to the 70 weeks of Daniel, the 69 weeks are 483 years, there's an interval during which God is dealing with the planet Earth through the church that has a terminus, it'll be finished, and God will once again be dealing with the earth through, the earth, through uh, Israel another seven, remaining seven years. The 483 plus seven is how much? 490. So to summarize that, it's interesting, there have been at least, there's apparently four different periods. Abraham to the Exodus, Exodus to the Temple, Temple of the Edict of Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes to the Second Coming. Each one's 490 years. So when I see this, I wouldn't make too much of it, uh, but at the same time, it's kind of provocative that Jesus says 70 times 7. I don't think he pulled that number out of the air. It's actually an echo of Israel's own history, which leads to another perception that you need to understand of the rabbinical Jew. He believes that the Messiah and the nation Israel are always, one, one's a shadow of the other. The history of the Messiah and Israel are in parallel with each other. And in the Gospel of John, you'll discover that the seven miracles profile the history of Israel. And the, 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 the man, the palsied man, he was infirm for what, 38 years, exactly the day, time of the wilderness. You can, you can explore that when you get through the Gospel of John on your second or third trip through. Okay, verse 23, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he'd begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. Boy, a talent is nominally about a year's wage. This guy owed a bundle. Wow. For as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife and his children, all that he had, his payment to be made. Man, oh man. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, I have, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. I'd love to know what his plan was. <laughs> the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Boy, that's great. It's one thing to loose him, and we'll, we'll deal with that later. That would be gracious. But no. He, for, he clearly, unequivocally, on the spot, forgave the debt. He was not only forgiven, it was off his shoulders. Can you imagine how he walked out of that room? Boy. That same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. A hundred denarii. By some reckoning, it's about $17. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down to his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But he went out and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. He's just been forgiven something in the neighborhood of twelve million dollars, and he's hassling this guy for seventeen bucks. Have you ever met somebody like that? Don't raise your hands. I okay. <laughs> So when his fellow servants saw that he was done, what he was done, they were very sorry, I can imagine, and came and told their Lord what was done. 
came and told the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Get the picture? Get the picture, gang? We're in that guy's shoes. We're in that guy's shoes. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father... Do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Boy, what a sobering insight. And very often, when I get upset about something, I praise God, the Holy Spirit will prick me on that and say, wait a minute, Christ has forgiven me so much. That doesn't give me license to be cavalier, but boy, it should give me license to be compassionate. Forgiveness, it's a little summary. Forgiveness never remembers our sin. I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget that. <laughs> it's not forgiveness. Never remembers our sin, Hebrews 10, 17. Restorative forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9. That's the Christian's bar of soap. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a precious verse that is. And disciplines retained in 2 Samuel 13. We should forgive others in Colossians 3 and also the Lord's Prayer. There are degrees of punishment. Let's remember that. And we'll make a, we won't use this as a springboard to get a whole study of de degrees of punishment. Let's just st stipulate it. And there's the verses if you want to track it down. Okay. Chronology. Titus was appointed in 14 AD. Augustus died in August, uh, August 19, 14 AD. So if... if uh, the ministry started in the, during the 15th year of Tiberius, so that would be 14-something. So it's 28-something that the chronology starts that we're using here in Luke 3. So we believe, we believe that the ministry began in the fall of 28 AD. That makes the fourth Passover, April 6, 32 AD, and we'll deal with that in a couple of chapters from now. All other chronologies that you probably will run into are bent around to assume a Friday crucifixion. We'll deal with that in a couple of verses. But we started at Nazareth. We go down for the baptism. that We went down there in, in uh, Matthew 3. Then the temptation of Jesus Christ in, in Matthew, Matthew 4 and also Luke 4. Then we went up to Salem and then to Cana. And that's really in John's gospel where we have the, the first uh, miracle, the, wet, the water and turned to wine. And uh, so we get to the spring of 29 AD. The first, the, as I say, the first miracle was in, in Cana. And he moves to Capernaum. And uh, there's a sojourn down to Jerusalem where he purges the temple, Nicodemus's visit. He tarried and baptizes all. The Gospel of John picks up all this stuff. But then uh, at Sychar, the woman on the well, on the way back up and what have you, uh, Jesus heals the son of the royal official in Cana. Um, John the Baptist is in prison in Jerusalem on Mark 1. Jesus begins his public ministry in the Galilee that Matthew picks up in chapter 4. And... Uh, uh, at Nazareth, of course, we have his, he announces his mandate for his ministry out of Isaiah, and he's driven out. They try to throw him off a cliff, but he slips away. He sets up his operational base in Capernaum, calls four disciples in Matthew 4. Peter had a draft of fish in Luke chapter 5. They're going to recognize that on resurrection morning, but that's another part of the story. Um, he, he, Peter heals his mother-in-law and so forth. Get to the summer of 30 AD at Capernaum. Healing of the paralytic, Matthew's call, detailed in Luke 5 and also Matthew 9. Uh, here's the corn on the Sabbath and all of that. The man with a withered hand, the, the fame begins to spread. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And then we have the centurion servant healed. He's the one that built the, the, uh, the uh, synagogue in Capernaum, by the way. And around Nain, we have the widow's son raised from the dead. That's about when we hear about John's query from prison. He dies at Simon's house, returns home, and that takes you to the autumn of 30 AD, back in Capernaum, the blind and dumb man healed, accused in this, accused as of Beelzebub. That's what closes the open ministry in a sense, Matthew 12. We have the seven kingdom parables then announced and interpreted only in private to the disciples in Matthew 13. 
as we zero in on the lake, we have the storm on the way to Kadera. We have the demoniac healed and the what we call the case of the devil ham. And we, <laughs> all right. And uh, they head back. And Capernaum, Jairus' daughter is raised. The woman with the issue of blood. Both have a 12-year issue going on here. Two blind men, the man dumb and best of All these, we're about Matthew 9 here. Then at Nazareth, the people take offense. The apostles are sent out in pairs in Matthew 10. This is where you encounter the execution of John the Baptist. Then the return to Capernaum. Spring of 31 AD at Capernaum. Return of the 12, retires to Bethsaida. Again, he feeds 5,000 and, and returns to, to Capernaum. He walks on water. Um, there's also the Sermon on the Bread of Life in John 6. Uh, eating with washed hands and all that business, get confronted with. Then we get to the summer of 31 AD. We're getting to the climax here. It surprised me to discover that Jesus took a summer cottage in Sidon, Gentile country, Mark 7. Interesting. He helped a Canaanite woman, and uh, then he goes to the region of Decapolis. That's where the deaf and dumb man in Mark 7. That's where the 4,000 are fed in Matthew 15. And then uh, we get back to Magdala. The Pharisees demand a sign. And uh, Bethsaida, the 11 of the Pharisees and Herod, he talks about all of that there in... Um, we're now at the autumn of 31 AD. We're getting to, the, getting to the climax here. Journey northwards to Caesarea Philippi. We were just there a chapter ago. And uh, the transfiguration occurs. Uh, different people have different views. We're assuming here it's probably Mount Tabor. And, uh, excuse me, Mount Hermon. And uh, many people assume it's Mount Tabor. I don't think it was because it was inhabited at the time. No, I think it was Mount, uh, Mount Hermon. But that's, who knows. And... Uh, that's where we have a number of other miracles can turn until he gets back to Capernaum. Then we have the tribute money question that occurred in the, you know, with the get a coin and the fish and so forth in Matthew 17. And then we get into this whole discussion that kicked off tonight's session, who is the greatest? So that is a sort of a geographic summary of where we've been. What's next is the Judean ministry. This was the Galilean ministry that Matthew emphasizes. But from here on out, we're going to be focusing primarily on the Judean ministry, which is going to lead up to the big deal, the, the final week. So your assignment for next time as we open up what I'll call Unit 2 is read Matthew 19 and 20 for next time. And with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.